What's up, fam? This is Jay, letting you know that Push Black has a new podcast called State of Criminal Justice. Every week, State of Criminal Justice digs into the most important events happening right now in the legal system. Listen, the future of our community depends on us understanding how injustice systematically operates in this country. State of Criminal Justice is here to ensure you're always up to date on how institutional racism is impacting Black people nationwide. State of Criminal Justice is produced by Push Black. You can catch it on our Push Black YouTube channel, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere you listen to podcasts. Thanks for the support. Peace. Be quiet, that's not ladylike. You look great, have you lost weight? Don't stay out in the sun, you'll get too dark. These are some of the sayings that, for generations, have been casually tossed around in the black community. But words matter, and phrases like this can determine whether we embrace our blackness or hate it. I'm Jay from Push Black, and you're tuned in to Black History Year. Anti-blackness doesn't discriminate. It's everywhere. It's in the schools, in the media, and sometimes even in the things we say. It may seem inconsequential how we use words, but they do have power. Often, without realizing it, we send messages filled with anti-blackness that the most impressionable of us especially internalize. I'm talking about our children. And these messages have led to rampant colorism and anti-blackness in the community often instilled in us from a young age. In order for white supremacy to work, we have to hate ourselves. Anti-blackness within our own community is a curse that's been plaguing our people for generations, but it's also a cycle that we can break. We got Farrah Jones with us today to help unpack these problematic phrases. Farrah is a writer, editor, and educator former middle and high school teacher. They currently write for various publications and present workshops and trainings around the country, focusing on racial and gender justice and community building. It's a great conversation and I'm excited for y'all to hear. First though, let's listen to a story about the harm caused through anti-black messages. A single bead of sweat slowly trailed down the girl's forehead. Her focused eyes searched for something she couldn't find. Bria Nettles, no more than nine or ten, was it in the game of hide-and-seek. She and her friends played beneath the summer's sweltering heat. Their laughs rang loud in the neighborhood block. The joy of being young and free propelling them in their playful game. The girl paused for a moment. She needed to catch her breath before she took off running again. She waited for her heart to calm, smile never fading, her eyes still seeking those hiding. She was having so much fun that she barely noticed the warmth of sun grazing her brown skin, too focused on the game to care, and too young to understand what came next. Bria! It was a voice she could recognize anywhere. Her mother. Perched on their home's front porch, Mrs. Nettles stood with arms crossed over her chest, a look of disdain planted on her face. Bria, she called. It's too hot outside. Come in here before you get too dark. The girl was confused. Why couldn't she keep playing with her friends? And what was the problem with being too dark? The next day, as she sat under a tree, the branches and leaves an umbrella of shade, Bria longingly watched her friends laugh and play beneath the warmth of the sun. But at least, like her mom said, she wouldn't get too dark. While this is a fictional story of a Black girl implicitly taught to hate the skin she's in, it's a reality too many Black people learn and carry with them for the rest of their lives.
What does black liberation look like to you? To me, black liberation means that black people are able to dream, that we can imagine a wide variety of impossible things, things we've never seen, never experienced, that we can just let our imaginations go wild, and that we don't even have to consider things like white supremacy or barriers or anything other than our own individual capacity to make those dreams happen. I think that that would be true freedom for Black people to just dream big. Thank you for that. So how does your work connect to that vision of Black liberation? Well, one of the things that I do when I'm maybe I'm giving a workshop or a training is I help people to understand the true nature of oppression because there are many different levels. And when we talk about oppression and specifically when we talk about racism, we often think about the interpersonal, one person doing or saying something racist to another person, or we think about the institutional. So legacies of housing discrimination, for example, or segregation. But there are other levels as well. There, we often call them the four eyes. So there's the even higher level, which is ideological. And that's kind of the ideas that undergird an entire society, the foundations upon which a country like the United States, for example, was created. The foundational beliefs of things like white supremacy and things like capitalism. So there's the biggest level is ideology. Then there's institutions that practice that ideology and the way they treat groups of people. There's interpersonal, which is how individual people treat each other. And then there's internalized. And that's when we start to believe things about ourselves. So we as Black people often, without even realizing it, believe anti-Black ideologies about ourselves, and we enact the outcomes of those ideologies against ourselves and against each other. And so helping people to understand the ways that we've internalized messages that aren't healthy, that aren't leading us towards liberation and freedom and love, and that in fact are doing the work of white supremacy for it is a crucial aspect of what I did when I was a teacher and what I do now as I'm an educator working in a different capacity, giving workshops and trainings around the country to help people better understand how these systems really operate. That's a great segue. So let's get into some of those ways that we have internalized this anti-Blackness. I know Push Black, we recently had a story around problematic phrases. I know you're familiar with this story. Mm -hmm. What are some phrases that really reek of internalized anti-Blackness? One of the ones that I would love, I think is most unfortunately familiar to a lot of Black people, especially Black women. I mean, one that I would hear a lot when I was a teacher is around not going out too much in the sun during the summer because you'll get too dark. And this is something that I would hear all the time. A lot of the girls would hang out in the shade instead of going out to play as young as, you know, 10, 11 years old. And they would explicitly say that they were doing it because they didn't want to get too dark. And it makes sense that this is something that a lot of our children believe because a lot of our kids were explicitly told by often their mothers, by, but by parents and adults in their lives, not to go out and get too dark. And so to cover up or to stay inside in the summer or to, you know, wear long sleeves or et cetera. And we see it all over the media and in our culture, this thing that we call colorism among rappers and celebrities who say that they refuse to date a dark skinned woman. You know, Western society, I guess, has defined femininity and it's defined it as being white, as whiteness. And so the opposite of that is blackness. And the blacker you are, the less feminine you are. So this is something that especially affects black women. You know, our society sees, and including a lot of people in our community, see a black man is more manly and thus, you know, more dangerous when he's darker skinned. And a black woman is more feminine when she's lighter skinned. 
I think it's really clear how problematic this is for us and for our people, but we end up perpetuating this with our own kids. And there's an incredibly long history of this going on, you know, paper bag tests all the way back to enslavement, where a lot of our enslaved ancestors were the product of sexual assault, to not use the a more um, intense term necessarily, and had parents that were slave owners. And so they were mixed race. They were often lighter. And then they often had positions of closer proximity to the enslavers. Maybe they had certain privileges. And so this then plays out over generations. Even today, you know, a lot of light-skinned, you see a lot of light-skinned folks on in TV shows and in movies and that are famous. And when a really dark-skinned woman especially gains prominence in society, whether she's a model or an actress or a musician, it's still a big deal, unfortunately. And one thing that's really important to say about this issue in particular is that a lot of parents believe that by sending this message to their children, they are protecting them. And I think it's really important whenever we talk about issues within our own community that we think deeply about the rationale behind it and how if you're telling your daughter or your children to stay out of the sun or to not get too dark, you might believe, maybe even without realizing it, this this will help them because it is easier to be lighter skin. You might get more opportunities. You might be viewed with more respect, you know, in a white supremacist society. Darker children are disciplined more readily, no matter their gender, and are viewed as older than they are. And like I said before, are viewed as more of a threat to law enforcement. So maybe we think, you know, well, if we try to use skin lightening creams or tell our kids, you know, to not get dark or wear makeup that makes us look lighter, et cetera, that we're trying to get ahead or survive in a racist society. And that might be true, but also we're perpetuating the colorism in our community and helping our children to internalize these messages that lighter is better and more beautiful and darker is worse and, and is a bad thing. And so I think that's just one example of an explicitly racist message that unfortunately too many of us heard as kids. So when you saw this on the, like in the schoolyard, in the school classrooms, mm -hmm. how did you speak to the students about it? Or were you even in a position to do so? In the realm of the education system, the impact of adults in a kid's life whether it's teachers or other school officials or relatives or whatever. And then the impact of peers and then the impact of parents are all extremely important when it comes to shaping a young person's sense of the world and sense of self and things like that. And so for some kids, I could, you know, send a message and give a counter narrative that would maybe make some impact but just being one person can't always counteract, you know, what's maybe the messages they get at home and messages they get on TV. I remember once I taught an art class and I had them doing a self-portrait and this young, really, really young girl, maybe 10 years old, nine years old, she had beautiful brown skin and dark brown hair. And I came over and looked at her self-portrait and she had drawn a light-skinned, blonde, blue-eyed girl as her self-portrait. And I know we've all heard of, you know, the doll tests and it's, it's heartbreaking to think that that is still happening in the same way to our kids today. And I asked her about it and I was like, oh, you know, like this is interesting. And she really didn't even understand herself why she had drawn the self-portrait that way, but she wanted to look beautiful. And that was the only way that she understood that that could happen was if she had been completely different than how she was. And so when, when the messages are that deeply internalized, whether they, wherever they got them, you know, as a teacher, I can do my best to push against it and to give alternative messages and to intentionally incorporate that in the teaching that I do. But I really think it has to start at home and it has to start young and it has to be modeled by the parents and the important adults in the child's life from an early age. Yeah, I think that's a great point. You know, someone with young kids and seeing what the influences are both 
in the house and outside. I've seen how their peers display something similar to what you said in terms of self-portraits. And I do believe a lot of this comes from the, the media. Even when you look at kids programming, we're sending a certain message. Can you name a show in which a Black family is the main characters and it's a light-skinned father with a dark-skinned mother? Hmm. I can maybe think of one example. I just feel like that is an example of how the media very subtly and probably unintentionally normalizes this ideology, this colorist idea is that like, even in, when it's not being explicit, I'm not talking about like music videos or, you know, movies, but just like general TV and kids, pro, you know, it's rare. I think that um, even though maybe this isn't the one to mention right now, but the Little Bill, maybe Cosby animated kids show had a dark skinned mother and a light skinned mm. father, I think. But I, I think that's the only example that I can think of. Yeah, there's not many out there for sure. And obviously there's not even many shows that have just black families and black communities. So kids are seeing images of blackness that are intended to appeal to someone else. There's shows, there's books that I believe aren't even necessarily intended to enrich black folks. It's like they're using black representation to get that additional black audience, but everyone you see around them is white. Or as you mentioned, there's a level of colorism that goes into it because of who's producing these shows. So in order to make the mainstream audience comfortable with this type of media, the representation can't be too black. And I think the effect mm. of that is how we view ourselves, how the kids will view themselves as okay, well, you can be black, and but you can expect to just exist in this white space or you can expect to look at something outside of yourself as a standard of, of beauty. Uh, I've definitely noticed how it takes a lot to be selective around what the kids consume and how that impacts their, their view of themselves. It's a constant, constant battle. I think something that is crucial that I'm not sure I got into deeply enough is really, I think not only has to deal with the media that we give our kids, there are the books we read them or the messages we explicitly send them, but it also has to do with modeling. And we tell our kids, you know, black is beautiful. And, you know, here's the message about a happy family, but actually would they hear us talking on the phone to our friends about, you know, how this person looked so dark and their kids are always watching. It ends up, you know, perpetuating a major issue in our society that I think we would have to really intentionally push back against. You know, in the 60s and 70s, we're talking about Black is Beautiful. And today there's movements around, you know, my melanin is popping or all shades of Black are beautiful. And there's some really, some high profile, like Lupita Nyong'o, who's, you know, Viola Davis, just like really beautiful, gorgeous, dark-skinned women in media. We think we, that's all wonderful, but we also have a really long way to go. And one of the ways that we can contribute to moving our culture forward away from colorism, I think, is to not send this message to our children. And to be explicit with them, dark skin is wonderful. Go out in the sun, get dark, get that melanin glowing because black is beautiful. Thank you for that. I tell my daughters that the sun loves our skin. We can stay out in the sun longer. The sun is kissing your skin or your skin is, you know, the color of the, the fertile earth. There's life there. Like things like that, I think, resonate with kids, which I think comes into this idea of self-defining and self-determination and us taking a stand on you know, what we value. So this is a big subject. I know we can do, we could probably do a whole episode just on this, a whole podcast series probably just on this topic. Um, but we have another phrase that we want to put out here. Yeah. So another thing that's super normalized, unfortunately, in our society is fat phobia. So what that is, is essentially just a general disgust with dislike of or aversion to having body fat on our bodies to appearing to be fat or overweight or obese. So something that's so common that a lot of people hear is you look great. Have you lost weight? And basically the idea is that we in our culture have often associated body weight with health. 
And this goes back really far as well into our history, specifically related to Black people. Although this this concept of fat phobia, it has a special significance for Black women. There's this great book called Fearing the Black Body. It's by Sabrina Springs. And it goes back to trace kind of a lot of the different ways that body type ideals have shifted over time. And specifically, there's a major shift in around the 17th, 18th century. And so if you look back at Renaissance art, fine art, you will see there's lots of curvy bodies. But right around in this, at least according to this, the research that Springs does in the 17th, 18th century, right around the time exploration of Africa and then enslavement started, the ideal started to shift. Um, and part of that was because European culture created this idea of self-restraint and virtue, which included abstaining from excess sexuality and sensuality. And part of the reason would be because those were things they associated with quote unquote savages like Africans. Africans tended to be thicker. There's a tiny bit of evidence that this could be because of racial differences, but there's more evidence that it's because of cultural ones. Um, that they just didn't have as many hangups about enjoying things like food and, you know, sex and, you know, dance and, you know, sensual things. And so fatness is perceived as something that is inherently bad because under the system of white supremacy, blackness is inherently bad. Yes. White culture developed this ideal of thinness that they associated with femininity, associated with self-restraint and virtue and morality seemingly to contrast whiteness with blackness. And one of the major goals of this is to better justify enslavement. The more you can create this image of the other, the more you can dehumanize a people, the easier it is to enslave them, to treat them terribly. Because you see them as less than human, it's not morally as wrong to do. Today, it's shifting again. I don't think it's a coincidence that black culture has made more and more inroads into mainstream culture and hip hop has become pop music that now the trend, the ideal body is extreme curves to the degree that cosmetic surgery is a booming industry. And, you know, white women are or not just women, but injecting filler into their lips and slightly darkening their skin to try and appropriate the changing ideal, you know? So there's always shifts in, in how, body image works, but the legacy of the history of fat phobia connected with racism and enslavement still affects us today. And you know what's interesting too? If someone is likely to say about a complete stranger, oh, that's unhealthy, that the, the weight that person has, I would probably put money on the fact that the person making that assessment doesn't really care about the person's health as much as they're just uncomfortable with their their weight. So I think the point of all this is that if someone is comfortable with how their body looks, then it's not on anybody else to make a judgment call and pretend that it's a concern for health when it's, it's, it seems to be more about someone's discomfort with the, with the stranger's body or the space they take up. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that that's spot on. And I think it's important to note that this is, these kinds of comments are primarily directed at women and I think that it's just, we have to think about the layer of sexism that's added into that, about how are women supposed to be, how are women supposed to live and express themselves and have their bodies. And I think there's a really complex discussion here about health and about public health and social good and messages to young people and older people. It's in our best interest to to really look into the nuance and think deeply about the impacts of different messages and and to find out as close as we can what is the truth, essentially. We have another phrase that we want to put out here. There's one around being ladylike. What's the, what's the exact phrase? The primary one that, again, a lot of Black youth here, especially Black girls, is just to be quiet. <laughs> that there's a stereotype of Black people in general, specifically Black children, that they are too loud, too rambunctious, too much energy and excitement. But it has a special character for young Black girls because of the association of quietness and respectability with their gender. That's interesting because from what I understand, 
black folks are more likely to encourage our kids to be quiet, especially if like we're out in public, to to be quiet. If you're at the doctor's office, kid, tell the kid to be quiet. Whereas I believe white folks are more likely to encourage their kids to ask questions, to speak up, maybe less likely to discipline them when it comes to having a certain tone or volume out in public. Based on the work you've done on this, what are the historical connections between Black folks encouraging you know, our kids and ourselves to be quiet compared to white folks or those of other races? Yeah, I think I think that the there's two major elements when you're looking at this issue. One is the historical, but another one is the practical, which I'd like to talk about as well. So I think that this really goes back to ideology. So if we think about how femininity is defined in white Western culture, it's women are supposed to be soft, fragile, quiet. They're supposed to be protected for, you know, many, many years. Women were kept in the home, white women, um, out of power, couldn't go out without a male escort. They're supposed to just be nurturing mothers who cook and clean and control the home. And that's it. And that's the ideal. That's kind of how they defined womanhood and femininity. And of course we know, you know, and so Sojourner Truth made it really clear that this was not the experience of black women. Black women were then traditionally defined as, as as much as possible as the opposite of white women, because that's one of the best ways you can dehumanize people. You can make them as other as possible. So black women work outside the home. They're bigger, they're stronger, they're more dangerous, they're more sexually promiscuous. You know, there's been decades of hand-wringing about black families and unmarried black women. And of course, they're louder. Because it's a crucial element of how our culture and society has defined white womanhood and black womanhood and in a larger scale, just whiteness and blackness as oppositional. And so when we tell our girls to be ladylike, we have to ask, you know, what does being a lady mean? Whose definition of lady or feminine are we basing that on? And when we tell our girls to be quiet and small and safe, telling them to be more like white girls, we're to some degree denying our own culture and we are trying to get them to assimilate instead of be themselves. I think that it's if we if we decided to, we could redefine femininity within our own culture and society. We could define femininity as strong and powerful, but we could define femininity as speaking truth to power, being loud and powerful in defense of and in support of your community. Fighting for justice out of deep love for one's family and community could be considered a, the most feminine thing a woman could do if we decided as a community that that's how we wanted to define femininity. But right now, a lot of us have this definition of what it means to be a lady that's backed up by white culture. And we tend to assimilate into that. And that's why I wanted to point out the practical aspect of it, as well as the historical, is that we want to protect our young people. You know, the louder black kid in the store or in school, in school, they get disciplined more, right? In the store, if a black child is throwing a tantrum, the white people around look and look, oh, it's a bad mother. It must be part of their culture. This is why black, you know, people are lesser than, right? Whereas if a white kid is in a store having a tantrum, it's like, oh, that kid must be upset today, right? So there's this whole layer of the white gaze and how we want to try and, you know, a lot of people tell their kids to behave in public and make sure that they're always extremely well kept in terms of their clothes and their, you know, they're washed and, you know, whereas some, you know, white kids often can run around being dirty or disheveled and it doesn't reflect poorly on white people as a whole. But we know that if our kids are acting up, it reflects poorly on black people as a whole. So there's a lot of pressure. There are practical reasons why we do this, but the implications of doing it are that we're, you know, assimilating into a culture that was not designed for our empowerment. And then if we look even historically back to Africa, a lot of, you know, pre-colonial cultures, there's matriarchies, there's, 
you know, women who are leaders, who are warriors, you know, and there's a lot of different ways that people organized families and power dynamics and all that stuff. And so we want to empower them to use their voices and, and, uh, and, you know, make big moves in the world instead of being small and quiet. That's real. And just want to throw another notion out there too, when it comes to black boys specifically, um, I know that there's always been a, this protective function that you mentioned that dates back to slavery for sure. Like if black, you know, black men, if they spoke out or stood up, they were made examples of in the most extreme ways. And that sort of encouraged, you know, older folks in the communities and the enslaved communities to, uh, to downplay a lot of elements of black boyhood, encouraging black boys to not speak out and not go against the grain, which I think carries on to this day. Um, even, you know, I've had that experience as well, you know, don't want to speak up about this, that because of the implication that violence awaits you on the mm -hmm. other side. There's a great book by Dr. Joy Degree called Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome mm. that tracks a lot, how a lot of aspects of Black culture, like what you just mentioned, can be tra traced back to the kind of practical survival strategies that we've had to employ for centuries just to, you know, not be, like you said, like violently faced with opposition to being ourselves or being full human beings. And so I think that there's, there's a really long, deep history there. And it's not, like you said, it's not just about Black girls either. It's about all of us. That is a good read. I encourage everyone to take a look at that book. Well, thank you for your time and your insight and your work on this fair. I appreciate having you on the podcast today. Um, and I think that, you know, these three phrases are widespread enough for us of all to have heard at least one of these in, in some way. So it's helpful to hear about the history and the implications of those as we try to find ways to define ourselves, find ways to practice self-determination and really figure out how we want to live as Black folks in the world, what rules we want to live by, what we want to value in order to move towards a liberated space. So, Fair, I appreciate you coming on. Is there any final words you want to share with our audience about um, any of what we've discussed? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I think that if we could think about these phrases and see if we can challenge them or eliminate them from the ways that we speak, especially around young people, that would be huge. I think that it's important to recognize that one of the ultimate goals of white supremacy is internalized self-hatred among Black people. And so I think the antidote to that is to, as explicitly as possible, teach self-love, love for community, and to explicitly provide counter-narratives. So if we can start with ourselves and think about the messages that we've internalized about what it means to be Black, that by modeling Black self-love in our own selves and the way we treat each other and our families, that actually can have an, a huge impact on the young people in our lives. Uh, more than just don't say this phrase, it's more about how do you practice and live out Black self-love in your life because that will get passed on to your kids and to young people in your life and, and everyone else that is around you and witnesses you. And so I, I would say that's that's what I would love to just, the message I would love to send to, to listeners is to love yourself as a black person and that will radiate out to everyone else in your life as well. And just like that, we're at the end of this episode of Black History Year. This podcast is produced by Push Black, the nation's largest nonprofit black media company. At Push Black, we agree with Marcus Garvey when he said, a people without knowledge of their past, history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. And I'm guessing you probably feel that's important too. I mean, you're here at the end of a podcast about black history. You matter. Your choice to be here matters. It lets us know that you value the work. Push Black exists because we saw we had to take matters into our own hands. And you make Push Black happen with your contributions at blackhistoryyear.com. Most people do five or 10 bucks a month, but 
Every little bit makes a difference. I appreciate you supporting the work. The Black History Year production team includes Tarek Alani, Patrick Sanders, Leslie Taylor Grover, William Anderson, Jerea Bradley, Brooke Brown, Siobhan Chapman, Tabitha Jacobs, Albany Jones, Brianna Lambach, Courtney Morgan, Zane Murdoch, Aquia Tay, Tasha Taylor, and Darren Wallace. Producing the podcast, we have Sydney Smith and Sasha Kai Parker, who also edits the show. And Black History Year's executive producer is Julian Walker. And I'm Jay from Push Black. Peace.